Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sneha Raghavan and I'm a senior researcher and projects lead for Asia Archive in India based in New Delhi. Um, thank you all for joining us today for the public presentation by Kunal Dukal um, titled A Movement of Images in the Political Underground, a study of communist periodicals from 1960 to 1990s Punjab. Um, Kunal was the first recipient of the SSAFAA research grant for histories of ideas, art writing, and visual culture in 2018. And it is in conjunction with this grant and the research that he undertook as part of it that we're organizing today's talk. Um, for those unfamiliar with our work, I would like to take a few minutes to introduce both SSAF and AAA as well as the grant. Um, the Shergil Sundaram Arts Foundation was established in 2016 with the mandate to carry forward the legacy of scholar and photographer Umrao Singh Shergil, his daughter and a pioneering figure of modern Indian art, Amrita Shergil, and her nephew and niece, artist Vivan Sundaram, and filmmaker and television journalist Naveena Sundaram. Since its inception, SSAF's mandate has been to support and enable conjunctions of artistic and cultural practice that deal with historical memory with a view towards building futures based on secular principles and freedom of expression. SSAF is committed to advancing creative independence and supporting alternative and heterodox practices. Asia Art Archive is an independent nonprofit organization founded in the year 2000 in Hong Kong with the mandate to research and document histories of modern and contemporary art from Asia and make these accessible online for free on our website. Asia Archive in India is a satellite branch of AAA established in 2013 with its base in New Delhi. And the work we do ranges from digitizing artists and scholarly archives, developing research projects to organizing programs that activate these collections. And we also offer grants for research and artistic practice. This collaboration between SSAF and AAA in India to offer this grant on archiving histories of ideas, art and visual culture was conceived in 2017 as a way of encouraging research into print and visual cultural materials of different kinds, journals, magazines, little magazines, posters, pamphlets, print ephemera, et cetera, from across different regional and linguistic milieus in India, and to explore how they contributed to, constituted, and were embedded in the cultural politics of a historical moment. Um, the grant anticipates the use of innovative methodologies for purposes of identifying, documenting, researching, and annotating materials that have hitherto been inaccessible in the public domain and are often fugitive for reasons often political in nature. The grant is currently in its fourth edition, and for more details on our recent and past grantees and their projects, I invite you to please visit SSAF and AAA's website. Um, it's with great pleasure now that I introduce the speaker for today's session. Um, Kunal Dugal is research fellow in the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of Edinburgh. Um, he is currently working on a research project titled Gurus, Anti-Gurus and Media in North India, supported by the Leverhulme Research Grant. He completed his MA in Art History and Aesthetics from MS University, Baroda and has a PhD in cultural studies from the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. Prior to joining the University of Edinburgh, he taught for three years in the Department of Art History and Art Appreciation at Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. His research interests revolve around the politics of caste, religion, media studies, and popular visual culture. Um, we also have the honor of being joined today by art historian Sanjukta Sundaresan, who has kindly accepted our invitation to be the discussant for Kunal's presentation. Sanjukta Sundaresan is senior lecturer in history of art in the Department of Arts and Culture at the University of Amsterdam. She is a historian of 20th century aesthetics, researching the interfaces of visual art, political thought, and the historical transition during 20th century decolonization in South Asia and across transnational formations in the global South. She is the author of Partisan Aesthetics, Modern Art and India's Long Decolonization, published in 2020, and co-editor with Lotte Hoek uh, of Forms of the Left in Postcolonial South Asia, Aesthetics, Networks, and Connected Histories, which was published in 2021. She's currently working on a second monograph on transnational conceptualizations of art and liberation 
during 20th century decolonization, thinking from the locational scales of South Asia. Welcome Kunal and Sanjukta. Um, before I hand the floor over to Kunal, a few points about the format of today's program. Kunal will make his presentation for about 40 minutes, following which we will invite Sanjukta to be in conversation with Kunal. And after that, we will take up questions and comments from the audience. Uh, please feel free to post questions or comments at any time during the presentation. We will do our best to take them all up um, at the end. Um, Kunal, over to you. <clears throat> thank you, Sneha. And I uh, first like to thank Stegen Sundaram Art Foundation and Asia Archive in India for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this work. And without taking much time, I'll start my presentation. My, the title of my presentation is A Movement of Images in the Political Underground, a Study of Communist Periodicals from 1960 to 1990s Punjab. And uh, uh, I would uh, request for the first slide. So uh, yeah. So in 2005, when I was doing Bachelor in, of Fine Arts, BFA in Applied Art, at the Government College of Art in Chandigarh, I was approached by a comrade, a friend's friend, to make an illustration for a poster. It was ubiquitous imagery in communist visual culture from Soviet era representing two figures, a man and a woman holding hammer and sickle. I was given an image as reference, which was a reproduction, a version of Soviet artist Vera Mukhina's iconic sculpture named Worker and uh, Kolkhoz Woman made in 1937. Next image. Uh, I remember being instructed to paint the picture in red monochrome to bring the figure of man at the front and to add a red flag in woman's hand. Later, when this comrade friend gave me a copy of the poster, uh, yeah, uh, I can't see my uh, PPT. Like, uh, is it? Yes, it's uh, visible. No it's it's visible. No worries. It's visible. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, the printed post uh, uh, later when uh, uh, I remember being in. Uh, yeah, sorry. Later, when this comrade friend gave me a copy of the poster printed in red monotone, comprising the unsigned image that I had painted which now I see as another addition in the recursive archive, consisting various improvised versions of Mokina's iconic image. The printed poster did not only thrill me that time, thinking that my creation being printed and consumed by many, but at the later juncture, this instance also made me interested in communist visual culture in the region of Punjab. In today's presentation, the images I will present comes from the communist print culture in the post-colonial, post-partition Punjab, starting from late 1960s to late 1990s. And like this anecdote, most of these images are sourced from various local, pan-national, and transnational locations, sometimes with a traceable or untraceable origins. Unlike other regions like West Bengal, we do not see here an individual artist figure like Chitto Prasad or Somnath Ghosh with an ooze uh, through which we can understand various influences on the content and forms they had produced. It does not mean that there are no names of individual creators, but there are no consistent actors, at least in the sphere of visual art. This informality and anonymity do remind us of calendar art and artists, but here in the minor key. Therefore, this work is an attempt to present a history of vernacular communism, as Charu Gupta would say, uh, has also named this vernacular communism. But I would also like to invoke Kajri Jain that how uh, she uses the vernacular, which by going to its uh, etymological uh, root and uh, is by saying that how vernacular means the slave that is born in the master's house and how basically even when the vernacular uh, is not a monolithic category there can also be a dominant and uh, marginalized within the category of vernacular so 
here I'm talking about the latter. And uh, uh, so the vernacular communism springs fear from the archives largely informal and scattered in the state of Punjab. In fact, when I started archiving these magazines in the state libraries, next image, and mostly in personal connections, the afterlives of these magazines exist in the form of annual issues kept in bound forms. But sometimes the binding is old and damaged by termites, next image, that one had to find ways to restore the pages from falling apart. Before coming to the late 1960s, I would like to briefly mention that the history of left-leaning and communist periodicals could be traced from the anti-colonial Gadda movement started in 1913. And uh, 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 next image, uh, image uh, slide number six. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, 1913, largely by Sikh or immigrants from, uh, uh, immigrants from undivided Punjab in the diaspora. The first other newspaper was published on 24th March 1914 in Urdu, followed by the independent Hindustan in English. Uh, next image. Uh, interestingly, we also see the trace of production process of this anti these anti-colonial newspapers through photographs. Next image. And uh, 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 a black and white photograph from Life magazine uh, in, uh, taken in 1943 shows known Communist Party of India leader Teja Singh Swatantra and Gadri Baba Gurmuk Singh Lalton in uh, informal clothing working on the editorial of weekly newspaper jang e azadi at the CPI committee's office in Lahore. Now we'll try to draw the connection between the Gadar revolutionaries in the context of 1960s through periodicals. In the 1960s, almost uh, uh, 20 years after India's independence, the Gadar Party's founder president, Baba Sohan Singh Bakna, was uh, uh, writing various pamphlets published in Hindi, Punjabi, and English, highlighting the contemporary crisis in the post-colonial, post-partition Punjab. Uh, uh, next slide. So. Uh, Slide number nine, uh, the slide uh, shows basically some of the uh, souvenirs from Mela Gadri Babayada, which is celebrated annually in Jalandhar, and the Desh Bhagat Yadgar Hall, which is dedicated to the memory of Gadar revolutionaries, was founded in 1992. And uh, uh, here we see uh, the cover image of the headquarters of uh, Hindustan Gadar Party. The next slide. The next slide is about like uh, it shows the Baba Sohan Singh Bhakna and uh, uh, again on one of the souvenirs. Then next slide. And it is from a periodical named Kaumi Leher where we see the uh, uh, image of uh, uh, Baba Hari Singh Usman. And uh, basically now it is uh, uh, basically like printed from the in the 1960s, uh, most probably, to connect the young generation from the uh, legacies of Gadrites. And next slide. From here, we come to know that uh, how they are trying to connect uh, and also the place from where it is getting published. So uh, Baba Sohan Singh Bhaknas, uh, where most of the writings were that we have not achieved the freedom yet. And that's why like, I take these writings as a starting point. It is important to note that uh, uh, Baba Sohan Singh Bhakna's writings in the 1960s were published by Youth Center, Yuva Kendra, located in Bhagat, Bhagat Singh's ancestral home in Khatkar Kala in Jalandhar district in the, uh, in the state of Punjab. Chris Mofat historically contextualizes the Youth Center at Khatkar Kala as the first institution built through initiatives from Bhagat Singh's uh, family to collect the scattered limbs of Bhagat Singh's corpus. And uh, next slide. And uh, uh, in 1965, the youth center was created and inaugurated by Bhagat Singh's mother, Vidyavati, and patronized by uh, uh, Bhakna uh, until his death in 1968. So uh, next slide. So uh, around the same time, after a gap of two years, 
the Naxalite movement started in West Bengal and in Punjab, which was the historical culmination of earlier movements to take the revolutionary heritage forward as emphasized by Bhatna in his writing. The Maoist cadre broke away uh, with CPIM and many Gadrites, Gadri elders, communists such as Baba Buddha Singh and Baba Gurmukh Singh, and the radical sec uh, sections among the students in colleges and universities joined the Naxalite movement. In this uh, next slide, in this context, the youth center at Khadkar Kala as a place of intersection where young Naxalite activists and poets such as Amarjit Chandan and others engaged with Bhagat Singh in varied ways with uh, Naxalite uh, uh, circles uh, named Naujawan Bharat Sabha, uh, forming a constellation of revolutionary past for the incoming generation. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So here you can see the youth center uh, and its address. The and again here you can see Baba Sohan Singh Bhagna's various writings. Uh, but next slide. Yeah. So here we see North Jawan Leher, uh, the front cover with Bhagat Singh in Trilby hat, and that was the first time in uh, when the uh, Bhagat Singh uh, essay Why I'm an Atheist was translated from Tamil which was published in a journal named Kadi Arasu. And then later, it, the English uh, version of the essay was recovered, and then it was again retranslated. Next slide. Yeah, so, uh, so it is uh, indeed this phrase was, uh, phrase was marked with state terror and human rights violations, such as illegal detention, fake encounters, custodial torture, harassment of anyone under suspicion and vilification of Naxalites as decoys and murderers through mass media. For instance, police also got printed uh, uh, various copies of a uh, periodical uh, um, uh, named Lok Youth and started harassing innocent people by planting its copies uh, and we weapons on them. This phase uh, came to an end after Charu Mazumdar's sudden death in police custody in 1972. The development of the movement in Punjab was significant for the Naxalites as they penetrated into one of the most prosperous states in India. The next slide, uh, the periodical cover from uh, CR. It needs to be highlighted uh, uh, that the post-independent, post-partition Punjab, uh, Indian Punjab, uh, witnessed radical transformation with the set of land and agrarian reforms aimed to increase the agricultural output. This transformation was further epitomized by the coming of uh, coming of capitalist farming in the late 60s, called the Green Revolution. Following this, the Punjab emerged as the food giver of the nation. However, the so-called prosperity of the Green Revolution has always been problematized because it highlighted the stark inequalities that exist among various categories of cultivators and benefited only the rich farmers. The next slide, it's a CR cover uh, with, yeah. The social and economic conditions of agricultural labor, laborers, mostly landless Dalits, deteriorated in terms of daily wage rate, everyday consumption requirements, and perpetual debt. Note that the Punjab has the highest population of Dalits, and one cannot ignore that the Naxalite movement is mostly Jatsik dominated. Here, the representations of the landless Dalits is mediated by the land-owning Jats. Uh, like so far in my research, I have not found any Dalit as an editor of these periodicals. And of course, the periodicals were also aimed at the literate, semi-literate uh, population, and which also like uh, uh, filters down to the readers of among the, uh, the Dalit population. Uh, so now I argue that the periodicals as uh, uh, circulating objects of knowledge one can assert from the outset that these periodicals as material objects 
representing the communist, precisely Nuxlite politics and aesthetics clearly foregrounds the historically important role played by the cultural front through modes of expression seen in the forms of poetry, literature, visual imagery, or theater, which still finds wider resonances in recent times. The process of identification with Punjab's revolutionary culture had gone uh, considerable, uh, uh, has undergone considerable development. Next slide. In the larger domain of the nation, through translations of re revolutionary poetry from Punjabi to English, Hindi, and other Indian languages, within the wider networks of publication and modes of circulation, in contemporary po politics, one can, uh, on one hand, we can see notorious figures like Hindutva uh, ideologue Dina, Dina Nath Batra recommending removal of past poem, Sabse Khatana, the most ominous, from class 11th Hindi textbook of NCRT. In counterposition, one can also see the wider resonances with the same poetry performed in various forms in wake of recent uh, nationwide protests against CAA and NRC started in 2019 and in the recent farmers' protests that went for more than a year on the borders of nation's capital, Delhi. Therefore, when it comes to cultural practices within Punjab's Naxalite movement, it can be, it becomes a less debatable matter as uh, Balbir Parwana highlights in his book, Kala Zindagi Te Naxal Bari Sarokar, that there can be matbhed differences regarding Naxal Bari movement's role in Punjab's political, social, or economic field. However, everyone is in unanimous agreement with its role and ascendance in literature and cultural field. It also needs to be clarified that the Punjab's Naxalite context, uh, the activist, artist, poet, and writer, or even editor and publisher in the context of publishing periodicals functions as quote-unquote overlapping categories where the individuals were performing multiple roles in different capacities and at various sometimes coexisting re re registers. For instance, lone theater person Gursharan Singh also played an important role as the editor and publisher of cultural magazines like Sardan and Samata. Therefore, most of the time, it's difficult to fit them in one particular category or role if in my presentation I look at them in one of the roles or capacities, it means that I'm focusing on that particular role in the context of my presentation. Nuxlite literature in may, is mainly called as kharku or jujharvadi. Both uh, words denote militant poetry and literature. Irrespective of mediums and forms of communication, one major concern that emerged from the interviews and life narratives of Naxalite activists is to bring art and culture to uh, people, to people's reach. Uh, and as like Sanjukta also looks in the fair Mao and like how Mao, uh, Mao's, uh, Maoist visual culture in the Indian context, the uh, main idea about taking the art to people's reach, uh, like the directness is very important. So it is important to examine the power and value of cheaply produced periodicals as circulating objects of knowledge, precisely because the role they had played in the visual literacy through images at the virtual level while communicating ideas or information coming from locus of ground or grassroots. Next image, that informed radical activism on actual plane and vice versa as part and parcel of political educational process. In my presentation, I attempt to show the coming together of ideas and images across various contexts where the wealth of information flowing from international, national, and local uh, uh, lo uh, regional locations, mostly as contemporary developments unfolding at the, that historical juncture, finding their place within the periodical which one could look uh, in Walter Benjamin's uh, Benjaminian sense of messianic time, but most importantly, one should look at Nuxlite movement in 
Punjab within the framework of traveling of ideas, where the idea in form of an event had emerged from one particular location that eventually got spread across different states that mainly translated this idea into a larger movement in post-colonial India, inspiring and impacting life worlds of people and their local conditions and conditioning, having diverse implications and repercussions in the reconfiguration of politics within the region. In short, regional perspectives would also defy the dominant understanding of Naxalite movement as movement. Therefore, the cultural politics and practice in a region is not an entity that exists in isolation, rather gets reconfigured through transactions, flirtations, and translations with ideas in the form of politics and aesthetics. This may bring a relativist understanding of the Naxalite movement in relation to its print cultures, and also it will bring a specific understanding of communism in Punjab in relation to its history, religion, and culture. So here we see the image from the cover of Surkhareka, and we see four like uh, uh, squares, like four representations, and like the windows opening to the world, and each like uh, talking uh, differently about different things. If on the right hand side we see Advani's Dhatyatra, then the, uh, below that we see a local Kisan Sabha at a village. Then on the top we see a Lenin and uh, with uh, like mentioning mainly in uh, conjunction to downfall of Soviet Union and taking down of the, uh, the uh, statues of the Soviet leaders. But then we see the uh, image of Mao, which is in September and uh, which is like commemorating the death anniversary of Mao. Next image. So we see very much in similar similarity to calendars where the in every like there is a Diwali season or there is a this season. So here we see the publication of portraits of the political leaders like Mao in December or in September commemorating his birth anniversary or death anniversary. Same thing with the publication of Bhagat Singh's uh, birth anniversary and uh, day of martyrdom in September and March. Next image, commemorating the May uh, day, uh, and here again we see uh, like the uh, it's like a May issue. So therefore, uh, the existence of different pictures as multiple fronts uh, of quote unquote scene in pages of periodicals bring us quote, uh, closer to Sanjukta Sundaraswan's reading of Chitu Prasad's illustration from Bengal, Femin in communist periodicals as, uh, as she writes, uh, pages from People's War and People's Age were unique in both uh, reflecting and constructing these horizons. The uh, scale of the local, the national, and the global were consciously brought together uh, within such frames uh, of visual re reportage of, uh, to produce a sense of struggle and solidarity across frontiers. This new visual scape of internationalism emerged from uh, emerged through reporting from multiple fronts: the war, anti-fascist resistance, peasant congresses, famine victims, and cultural tours of the communist front, as well as creating multiple fronts of scene resistance. Close quote. So again, this mobile vision by having various images at one uh, particular cover is also uh, like uh, uh, is like oscillates to the stilling of the viewer and the viewed when the portraits of mostly men fair looking and uh, also like iconic uh, in its nature are being published in the on the covers of these periodicals now the another important thing is that the period uh, underground is to context contextualize underground is not that easy because it, all these periodicals have also been uh, like struggling with finances and uh, here we see the images of advertisements of tractors 
of uh, basically like uh, uh, fertilizers which also sync with the uh, changing agrarian landscape of the uh, Punjab and uh, uh, like uh, hand pumps, chemical fertilizers, medicines. So we see these uh, the people coming from uh, uh, advertising in these periodicals and not all periodicals were uh, advocating to the militant nature and uh, many of the periodicals were also cultural uh, and literary in nature and we see in past uh, auto uh, like uh, autobiography written by Tejwan Singhil that he distanced himself from the uh, very militant nature of certain periodicals and started his own periodicals uh, which were also had varying lifespans. So uh, the very political uh, charge uh, embedded and inscribed on each and every page of these periodicals, literary and political uh, little magazines with visual imagery in various idioms on their covers and formal outside and is literary content in the inside as an overall medium of communication played the role uh, played the most important role in creating the ethos of revolution and comradeship among the communities of radical political activists in the field of activism. Here, uh, Kajri Jain's theorization uh, uh, around calendar art could be applied in the context of periodicals that their value is not solely or primarily located in their visuality or image efficacy, but on their corporeal and material practices. If on one hand, devotional ritual performance of seeing and being seen called darshan uh, with host of other bodily practices forms uh, one of the basis of sacred economy in the context of bazaar. Then on the other hand, one needs to theorize various modes of embodied intersubjective engagements with periodicals. If we consider a word as image, or in the context of seeing while reading, writing, editing, and printing as also a form of labor, intellectual labor, and how the very peculiar aspect of the image is that it always like goes beyond the literal meaning where that is described in the world. So here the members of this community that comprise of activists, writers, poets, and like-minded readers, literate, semi-literate uh, public, exist mostly as overlapping registers and categories, performing roles in different capacities on various levels of production, circulation, and consumption. Also, uh, uh, various forms of labor with periodicals as objects or, and sites of knowledge. So again, I would like to show the another periodical cover. Uh, uh, next slide, the cover of MA uh, periodical. So, this also brings a certain uh, blind spot uh, uh, into discussion that how gender and caste remains uh, like the blind spots in most of these periodicals. Ma is was one of the periodicals that was published with a female editor, uh, Kevil Kaur, who was also an activist, who was jailed and forced to commit suicide. Uh, and the uh, next image from the editorial of Ma. So here we see one of the rare images of uh, Kewal Kaur, uh, uh, clicked by Amarjeet Chandan. And in uh, editorial itself, like uh, it brings out the question of invisibilization that how women, like uh, she also terms them as gulam and how they have to break the shackles. And again, bringing the question of the freedom that has not been achieved. And uh, also uh, bringing the question of taste that which woman is free? The bourgeois uh, or the upper class woman is free, but is that the freedom of uh, the working class or a proletarian class woman uh, aspires for? Now the second image is again, very interestingly, it also brings the intersection of gender and race where uh, by uh, again like uh, translating and republishing the statement uh, for, uh, for uh, Angela Davis. 
and it was published in the Southern Vietnam Struggle Weekly. And uh, uh, so, but of course, like it also resonates with the uh, like context of uh, the uh, Punjab's own location. So, uh, but it does bring out the uh, pan af uh, like you know the so solidarity between African Americans. Africa as a region and with Vietnam and other Asian countries to the fore. Now the second next image is of uh, from the Rohli Ban cover. So again the representation of women we see mostly as a guerrilla warrior. Next image. So and coming from the context of Cambodia, Vietnam, and uh, Thailand. But uh, next image. Uh, so we also see the though we don't know uh, uh, much about the women activists like Kewal Kaur is one of the examples that comes up, but we see the huge participation of women in the uh, protests, in the gatherings uh, in, uh, published in these uh, periodicals and through the photographs, this invisibility becomes visible that they have been the active participants in uh, these uh, uh, this movement so uh, yeah uh, yeah so to an extent one could say that the periodicals coming from the communist movement since the time of gadar movement had historically represented voice of the oppressed whether poor indian immigrants during anti colonial struggle against british rule in colonial india or with naxalite movement highlighting crisis in the post colonial situation with active participation of Dalit uh, activists and poets, through, though fairly limited in number, such as next uh, image, uh, such as Santra Mudasi and Lal Singh Dil, publishing their poetry in periodicals coming from the fringes of uh, radical left politics. This also presents a different picture of Punjabi communists who were mostly from peasant background belonging to Jat caste and Sikh religion. And uh, uh, as uh, the, uh, the founder of Kirti magazine, like Santok Singh, uh, like as uh, uh, Bhagwan Josh says, read Marx Capital and recited Gurbani simultaneously. Whereas if we compare this with the Bengali communists, uh, especially in the sphere, mainly in the sphere of the knowledge production, so we see like, as uh, Sanjukta Sundarasan's book show that through the Parichoy group that the left leaning writers coming from the upper caste Bengali Bhadralog background, exchanging letters with uh, Herbert Reed, and also like so, uh, uh, like that sort of difference. I mean, though I'm saying that uh, both the activists uh, engaged in the knowledge production come from the upper caste dominant location, but there is still a difference. So, uh, like peasant. Uh, that caste uh, uh, activist is different from the Bengali Bhadralok uh, activist. So the next thing is uh, about uh, the networks. And through these, period, though, uh, through these periodical supporting Naxalite ideology, we need to pay attention to the networks of uh, pr uh, printing and promotion in these periodicals. Most importantly, the camaraderie shared by these intellectual uh, activist network of print culture. The scholarship so far on print network in the context of religious calendar art looks into the vernacular capital, uh, capitalism or art in vernacular print culture. Through caste and community forms uh, 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 through the uh, credit and kinship networks that Kajri Jain calls as networks of trust. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, come to like, can you uh, move the slide to the slide number 41, which is basically an advertising shows uh, to the uh, uh, to promoting the readership of Rohle Ban and Jathe Bandi, which was published in CR. And again, like, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, however, while looking at the radical left print culture, which is positioned as subordinate in uh, relation to dominant uh, popular visual culture. Uh, so therefore, here the networks of trust among activist, editor, writer, poet, 
performing in multiple capacities in production and circulation of Nuxlite periodicals could be called as partisan networks not in terms of a particular party or fraction as such, but towards a common revolutionary cause or a network of comradeship term commonly used within the communist periodicals to address each other. And here, uh, so as I talk about the periodicals as object of knowledge, but then they also become the object of threat. And uh, it is like uh, very well documented that how uh, like slide number 39, like uh, how uh, ba basically the editors of various periodicals were harassed and uh, how the copies were planted and how they were dragged to the courts and uh, how they had to defend themselves in the courts. Now, the other language which becomes very powerful in its critique is the uh, language of cartoon and uh, image number 43. So here we see like when, during the declaration of emergency that how uh, the caricatures uh, basically uh, uh, critique the Indira Gandhi's emergen uh, emergency, the whole de desire to centralize the power. And uh, next image. So uh, yeah, and the next image, which is the uh, cover from CR uh, with the eye. So it is in this context of this forceful suppression over freedom of expression and continued structures of systematic inequalities and injustice. Uh, we see from late 1960s, a growing disillusionment and waning of hopes in people, especially the youth in realization of actual dreams of freedom to mark this moment of a moment of uh, disillusionment on 25th anniversary of India's independence, the cover of CR from August 1972 issue shows the cover illustration by Chetan Kumar with words "White tears in the eyes of freedom." The magnified eye looking at the viewer is not the eye of God giving darshan to the devotee, but it is an eye of the time as witness to the scene of a crime unfolded in front of its eyes like, uh, uh, like a staged fake encounter over citizen subject. The context of the illustration was described by Pash inside the issue as main concern. And Pash says, uh, uh, on 15th August, it's going to be a silver jubilee of India's independence through spectacular celebration a violent assault, misdeeds, and exploitation committed by the ruling class for past 25 years will be brushed under the carpet. But the eye of time is crying. In front of uh, time, people demanding their rights are being shot with bullets. In front of time, the rulers of this country are hell-bent to crush any voice of dissent through forceful uh, violent suppression. So from here, I move to basically the whole idea of Sikh inheritance, the very like uh, predominant presence of religion and uh, uh, in the Nuxlite periodicals and which also becomes very important with the coming of the uh, 1980s with the emergence of Khalistani movement. So similar to that goes with the imagery coming from predominant popular Sikh visual culture specifically representing the thematic of Shahidi. Uh, here we can uh, see the image of uh, image number 49 from Surkh Rekha with Sikh martyrs on uh, several magazine covers. And in Sikh visual culture, the pictures of martyrdom are categorized as history paintings painted by a popular Sikh painter, Kirpal Singh. And these history paintings are mass produced in form of calendars, framing pictures, booklets, and so on. It needs to be highlighted that the rhetoric of martyrdom played and continues to play a significant role in the consolidation of Sikh community through invocation of history belonging to Sikh Shaheeds and their Shahidi while turning the viewer uh, into a witness, also mean Shahid. Uh, of performed torture and bravery in the images. 
Here, the martyrdom can also be seen as a point of intersection where the connecting Sikh history of martyrdom with martyrs belonging to anti-colonial and a slight struggle, bringing the eminence to the fore irrespective of the context in the religious, political, and cultural landscape of Punjab. Uh, and uh, this also forms a specific regional character of Punjabi communism where religion and non-religion or atheism as mainly seen with leftist ideology are not always binary opposites in typical fashion, but as coexisting switching points that were strategically deployed in Naxlai periodicals. And uh, the second last imagery, so we see a lot of uh, images of Guru Gobind Singh being published, and this is the image of Guru Gobind Singh uh, painted by so a Sobha Singh, a known Sikh painter, also called as a divine painter. And here this monotone print, which basically tries to uh, say that uh, the great journal, the general who founded Khalsa Army, the Guru Gobind Singh. So these images uh, in the monotone print is being printed by Surkhareka again and again to show the Guru figure. And as I have uh, talked elsewhere, that how these images of uh, devotional images of Guru Gobind Singh painted by Sobha Singh, actually through embodied practices, everyday worshiping practices becomes Guru as a person. So here these images that is being printed. So the tactic was to again and again uh, show that how the Sikh radicals who are basically trying to they present themselves as the representative of the religion are actually quote unquote fake and uh, one needs to basically like follow the uh, true guru so then the fake guru but uh, even in terms of Sikhism uh, this also comes that uh, the periodicals uh, argue that it is the religion of the proletarian and uh, it is like the religion of Bhai Lalo like who is like a, a proletariat like a, 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 a lower caste figure a couple comes up in janam sakhis of guru nanak so and uh, this invocation this theorization was also done by by interpreting sikh religion and sikh tradition as the uh, like a tradition of for the proletariat and which is anti feudal is also theorized by uh, like the literary figures like Kishan Singh, who also like uh, basically started from Heer Varish Shah, where he looked as Heer as an anti-feudal character, but also then gradually moved to the Sikh Gurus and uh, uh, argued that uh, they are, uh, belongs to this genealogy. So the last slide, here we see as like uh, the, again, the, Punjab as a like you know the embodied the map of Punjab the leaf configured map of Punjab the post partitioned again then uh, with the uh, again reformed Punjab in the uh, after the linguistic formation and uh, how the symbols of like again the crying eye the burning and the bleeding becomes important to show that the how people are collectively witnessing the uh, atrocities and the tortures from both the state and from the kind of insurgency that is taking place from within the state. And here I want to say that the uh, it also brings another contradiction to the fore that the uh, activists who were part of the Naxalite movement, it also like various splits happen and a group named Pagam group, uh, which was like a Khalis, uh, became a Naxalite group, became a Khalistani group. And then it also became like, uh, like they became uh, like in, in, uh, oppressors of each other. And again, it uh, uh, basically started another like uh, uh, episodes of violence where Naxalites were killed by the Khalistanis as it has been also shown in the documentaries like Anand Patwardhan's Kithe, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, in memories of, uh, memory of friends. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Well, thank you so much, um, Kunal. I think we've seen you lay out an incredibly sort of complex journey of print politics in the context of Punjab, and that too in such a short span of time. So <clears throat> thanks very much for that incredible presentation. And um, without further ado, I'd like to invite Sanjukta to please share your thoughts on Kunal's presentation and begin the discussion before we take up audience Q&A. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Neha. Um, Kunal, thank you so much for bringing in uh, such a rich, like Neha said, such a, uh, Neha said, such a rich body of uh, material, but also um, uh, talking from the perspective of um, a strangely marginalized region, I would say in post-colonial India. Um, substantial research on uh, pre-independence Punjab ha, exists in partition studies or, you know, um, Ali Raza's work, also in yeah. communist. But I often find it difficult that in, terms, in post-colonial India, all these things disappear. It doesn't really come out in historiography. So in that sense, uh, uh, thank you for uh, today's talk, but also the larger work you're doing, I guess, uh, you know. Um, so I have, a I had fairly organized points, but then as you spoke, it, there is a strange web on my page. So I think I will make two points in the beginning. Maybe you can start responding and then I could go to a third point, which I would really like to discuss. So I think the first point that strikes me and having done resonant work, I would say, not similar, but resonant work. The question of what you begin your paper with, the, the question of um, the, uh, the archive and the actors um, strikes me. Who are the actors in this um, um, movement, maybe a word one could use, but in this field, let's say. Who are the actors and what are the archives? And you highlight the anonymity and the informality of it, uh, which I think is a very, very critical historiographical point that you're making. Um, and the underground that you brought out, uh, the, uh, you know, when we talk about periodical literature, often we are talking about, at least you are uh, in this context and many others working on left iconography are talking about little magazines and underground literature, very little funding. And even when they get funding, they have to advertise tractors and the green revolution while talking about, right? So that contradiction you brought out, Maybe you could reflect a bit um, today on where you find the material and what kind of difficulties you encounter. Um, in, because I'm sure there are many researchers here who are. And connected to that, and this might not be your field, but it is, I'm, I'm tempted to ask it, what does it mean to use visuals as archive? Now, for example, I, I often think about what is art as archive, and I, I work with modern art, you know, that kind of space. Huh? So you're talking about a difference. So that's one point, if you could reflect a bit on the archive and the actors, the different kinds of actors. Um, you mentioned the Porichai group in the 30s. In the 60s and 70s, it's a very different, uh, let's say, class of people. And that almost, you know, runs like a contradiction in the heart of the left movement in Bengal, which kind of uh, consumes itself, one could say. The second point I had was tied to scale. Huh? So, and both Bengal and Punjab are partitioned regions of India and regions that had very strong uh, activist lineages. And so, my question is, what can Punjab offer to historiography for post-colonial uh, South Asia? I'm saying South Asia because there is a substantial part of Punjab that continues to create all kinds of counter-national paradigms in Pakistan. And the Pakistani mm -hmm. state has yeah. to then accommodate that radicalism coming from Lahore and so on. So if you could reflect on these two points, the actors and archives, and then maybe what can Punjab offer as two post-colonial historiography, the location of Punjab. Yeah. And then maybe I could talk about the historicity and all that. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, thank you for these uh, uh, amazing questions. And uh, so uh, first with the actors. And uh, so when I start, so this is the uh, work that I basically uh, just uh, very briefly uh, started when I was doing my MA a dissertation uh, at MSU University Baroda because it did trigger me as I started that, you know, like there is a particular history 
in which uh, the, the there is a printed material and visuals that play the role. And when we were in the art college, lot of art student, college students will go to Mela Gaji Babiada, so mm -hmm. the annual fair in Jalandhar, and they have like all kinds of like the uh, if you say like the kind of cultural front suggested by Ritwik Ghatak that you know kind of activities that one needs to have to bring you know like uh, yeah like mm -hmm. ideology to the people so like they have like the on the spot painting competitions and like you know rangoli competition mm -hmm. then you know poetry recitation and the quiz like all kinds of these and it's a very like uh, and during that time it just becomes a very different uh, like space because the absence of indian flag because the Gadar party's flag only becomes the prominent one, and uh, and they have like their own like yeah like uh, cultural activities to which they commemorate uh, that particular uh, yeah, legacy. So uh, then uh, some of these periodicals like officially they are uh, in institution like uh, Punjab Sahitya Academy's library in Ludhiana, and mm -hmm. where they have kept and but uh, the condition is like completely like uh, dilapidated I can imagine. Uh, it's now mm -hmm. yeah I, as i did the cello tape uh, restoration as the slide which i showed was from the that particular uh, 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 library the other mm -hmm. interlocutors that i approached was through uh, like basically some of my friends like mm -hmm. uh, some of my like friends who are active in the like activist or cultural circuit and uh, through them basically i approached some of the activists such as darshan khatkar who is a, mm. a naxalite poet and activist and still very active so from his collection i documented uh, hiraul dasta vanguard guard periodical and uh, so which uh, brought like the entire archive especially from the uh, like uh, because it was also the party of Jamal Singh Padda who was assassinated by Khalistani. So a lot of material from 1980s uh, came from that, that yeah. particular archive. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, group is Surkh Rekha group, and which is still active. The, the periodic, Surkh Rekha periodical is still being published. So they were uh, like brought like the, the periodicals, like those bounds, like filled in sacks and uh, to Desh Bhagat Yadgar Hall and uh, uh, like yeah so as a researcher doing this research I also shared like all the digital documentation with them because yeah. it is like really important for any like researcher working on this particular topic whether from the uh, through the looking from the framework of literature or poetry or theater anything it's uh, uh yeah so uh like yeah so these are some of the actors that i met and i also interviewed them and they were the one who brought lots of interesting points which comes to the second point about the what punjab has to offer to the post-colonial history uh especially so one thing is that it's also a region which is a uh, like you know the predominant population is non-hindu like hindus are the minority and it's only after kashmir and that you know like uh, uh, that it becomes one of the regions where hindus are the minority like mm. uh, and uh, so the re predominance of the religion and its various legacies uh, uh, with Sikh religion uh, and the whole tradition of martyrdom and the way like it always like being in the controversy so uh, like recently you know like uh, someone said that uh, Bhagat Singh is actually a terrorist so mm -hmm. those kind of debates keep on happening and someone says that Bhagat Singh was a Sikh so these kind of tussles always go on happening Player the uh, communist side will say no he was a atheist and the other will say he was a sick but largely through other cultural folk practices or as i say the janam saki tradition which invokes that this is a religion of bhai lalo and uh, mm. so 
i think religion religion plays a very important role and uh, generally most of the theorizations on the left uh, people try to only see uh, in in the relation with martyrdom like even in ali raza's book the sikh uh, uh, socialism comes only in relation to uh, the uh, martyrdom but actually it goes much more beyond that and that's why i saw that uh like what is this intersection where you know this these periodical these images are in some kind of uh, they are intersecting with the sphere of the bazaar these bazaar mm. images are also making entry on the cover and use are and being used in a very tactical form where the you know like the monotone prints like images the portraits of guru gobind singh like what is it doing so how it is being used as a weapon to actually defeat the religion and this is mm-hmm. something which uh, like my uh, one of the interlocutors did tell me that uh, that's how they used and uh, if you see one of the slides where basically when the police arrested them so there mm-hmm. was this one quote from guru yes. gobind singh was when. printed when all the you know everything failed you should re, you know pick up the weapons and the police thought that it is a quote from mao zedong wow. and, yeah. <laughs> and they generally said that why you only read uh, the 10th guru and you know why can't you do you know uh, basically refer to any other guru so and uh, yeah 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 so no. i think uh, yeah generally there is a hesitation when it comes to uh, uh, like uh, the theorization of the left to yes. you know not to engage with it religion but actually yeah yeah no thank you thank you very much and actually this is a good place for me to talk about the second the second set of points i had um and this is something i am myself thinking about so it's not fully articulated but uh, you talk about walter benjamin's idea of the messianic time right mm-hmm. and uh, you know within the scope of the paper you have not had the time to go into it but i feel Walter Benjamin is one person that you could safely go to um, sure. when you talk about uh, not being able to theorize the left and thinking about religion, because mm-hmm. that's one thing he points out, actually mm-hmm. saying that historical materialism has to take theology seriously, and it obviously doesn't want to do that. And he says that in the 1930s, uh, he really tries to, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of Benjamin's idea of the concept of history. and relating historical historical materialist he's talking about historians but we could talk about mm-hmm. activists huh? uh, poets writers and what role theology plays in that uh, thinking about religion plays in that um you mention this journal surkh rekha a lot and i'm thinking that surkh rekha basically means a red line yeah right and i find that whether it is the the cr or surkh rekha or lakir the question of line comes up and maybe i'm thinking like an art historian here but that 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 repertoire of line and linearity and uh, lineage and genealogy you can keep pushing it and i really feel that the question of messianic time and the question of the red line of history constructing a red line of history right not a givenness of the red line of history but a let's say a locational vernacular construction of the red line of history mm-hmm. for punjab which might not match with bengal or kerala or whatever be the case i think you could pay attention to that because you are looking at visuals but visuals in a more chaotic way right uh, it's not artists and you know we talk about chitta prasad and somnath hor etc nobody knew chitta prasad in the 70s nobody cared now it is huh, in the past 30 20 30 years that so these are often anonymous um, or let's say marginal uh, actors and then how to bring them into historiography could be a matter of constructing a red line so a kind of the role of the left in historiography mm-hmm. that's one and the other thing and i'll just stop with that is and you bring it out in the paper so beautifully and i'm so glad you're talking about sohan singh bakna's question of freedom being incomplete ha huh? or or that fantastic image of the the eye uh with with the the, the encounter yeah. the shooting and that was 1972 i think and i'm yeah. very struck and maybe i could share with you later 
you know, at the same time, an artist like Bikash, again, I'm talking from the spaces of modern art, you know that? He does this image of a student being shot, uh, very Goya-esque kind of being shot point blank. Uh, 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 the face of the student is covered, so anonymity. And recently I found out that similar images were circulating in apartheid South Africa of students being shot like that. And it's very much 1971, 72, that period. So, mm -hmm. so there is maybe a wider citational culture. I don't mean they are actively inspired, but a, a, a general zeitgeist that brings in a sensibility of anonymity and uh, state torture and so on and so forth. And how in this line then, India might be absent, right? Or a particular euphoria around independence might be absent. So maybe you could think about historiography a bit. You begin, you can, you can use Benjamin or not, it doesn't matter. You have your own Benjaminian argument, which is of thinking of the, huh? it might not be martyrdom, but it might be mm -hmm. thinking via faith. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I'm going to shut up, but I think you could really foreground that quotation you had on Guru Gobind Singh being mistaken as a saying from Mao. Uh, I think that really is the crux. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just very excited about your work. And um, maybe you all could take questions now and I'm sure you'll get uh, exciting questions. Good luck with the work. But uh, the point about historiography, I really think you could, um, if you yeah. want to respond, you can, but maybe you can think along and... Uh, I think the question of line that you pointed out is a really interesting, uh, entry point i think one can yeah like i should put more uh, emphasis on that it's a very very important point i didn't thought like that yeah like and though even in the illustration some of the illustrations uh yeah the predominance of the line is there in most of very them much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 that's yeah and with the messianic time i think i was of course uh, like thinking more in the, uh, like uh, by thinking more in relation to the calendars, like which are also <laughs> being produced, you know, like uh, yeah. uh, according to the so-called, you know, the Gregorian calendar, calendar mm -hmm. but it has the, uh, you know, image of religion in it. So how the sacred and the secular, so-called, you know, sacred and the secular time. So how it all, you know, like come up like yeah uh, like in emancipation way. would be a good yeah. point too because yeah. that is what yeah. is occupying benjamin in the uh, in 1940 let's say sure uh, so hmm. that could also help because yeah. you're talking about freedom you sure. know like the sohan singh bhaknas yeah. yeah. the gatherite yeah. uh, um, uh, just one quick point I'm remembering um, what's her name, uh, Laili Uddin has done very good work on yes. the Mela uh, Mala take a look Bhasha at that Mela. Yeah, 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 around yeah. the Mela as a site yeah. where all these things come together, mm. you could maybe look at that um, sure yeah. yeah thank you thank you um, I see that there are <clears throat> two questions uh, from the audience, so maybe we can uh, take mm. them um, the first one is uh, from Professor Nuzhat Kazmi, uh, and uh, okay. she congratulates you, Kunal, on your uh, ongoing brilliant presentation, and is keen to know what could have been the content of the critique of Ghalib in Benakab Ghalib, um, as well as in two, mm -hmm. in other two publications, Nehru Benakab and Gandhi Benakab. Mm, okay. Uh I think with Benakab Ghalib, I can't say much, but with uh, Nehru and Gandhi, I can say because I also attended several plays where Gandhi is being mocked. So like there is one play which I attended at uh, uh, DK, uh, and uh, it was like uh, this play called it Itihas Ke Nukkar Tum, from the corner of history, and which was basically traces the uh, like family history of uh, Bhagat Singh and his uncle Ajit Singh. And then there is like uh, uh, this very sharp contrast where the, you know, of course, a very masculine uh, active Bhagat Singh, you know, standing in contrast to very feeble uh, looking uh, Gandhi, who is also being showed as like, yeah, so as like in a very, uh, a kind of a mockery of Gandhi. 
has been done. So, uh, with uh, regard to like a Nehruvian, uh, the critique of Nehruvian model is already there, also there in Baba Sohan Singh Bhatna's writing about that Nehruvian socialism is a sham kind of a thing. So, yeah, yeah. Um, we have another question uh, from Prabhnur Kaur, um, who uh, is saying, um, thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering if you could speak uh, to whether there has been a resurfacing of this imagery within the contemporary agrarian movement. I mean, uh, Naxalite cultural forms have never died when it com whenever it comes to the performative uh, aspect of it has never ever like has always been there like it, it has been performed from the campuses of JNU to Baroda and uh, and of course within Punjab so uh, the question of resurfacing is uh, I would say that the very particular role of the Naxalite leadership which gets dispersed into various fractions, like there is an active rationalist movement by, uh, like you know, like Tark Bharti, uh, which is also another one fraction that comes from the Naxalite movement. But then the other is like also the presence of uh, uh, like so many farmer movements uh, leaders, especially uh, like at the Tikri border, like which was like much more. Uh, yeah, like, uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, there has been enough reportage also being done where, like, people talking about how, uh, like, like, songs of Santaram Udasi and uh, also of, like, Pash, his poetry, and uh, being performed and being uh, invoked at various junctures. So, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, we have a question now from uh, Arindam Sen, who says, um, thanks for the wonderful talk. What is fascinating is also the design and layout of these periodicals um, based on what glimpses we get from your presentation. Could you elaborate on this aspect a bit more? Uh, size, relation between text and images, production quality, use of color or monochrome, the variables and the constants in these. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, uh, that is something which I'm still struggling with because I try to ask uh, and coming from the field of advertising, I yeah, definitely like I was asking about like who designed the, you know, this like Rohle Ban being, you know, written in with the shape of arrows, like, you know, so and they like have just told me that, you know, it's like we just go to the printer and they will only themselves like do some uh, arrangement and it will come out. But uh, this question of design is a really like fascinating size and design. This is something which I have to engage more with uh, in terms of like, yeah, um, to, I guess I have to go more like, yeah, like uh, deeper to understand how this whole process is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, uh, Professor Nuzhat, uh, okay, well, uh, has sort of said that your response gave an important perspective on the Congress national movement um, in context of other growing movements uh, that you have taken up here. Um, we have more questions from the audience. So, um, Santosh, uh, is asking, are you trying to argue that the Naxalbari movement of Punjab is an example of vernacular communism? Um, further, it seems to me in a way that on the one hand, you're suggesting that the communists of Punjab use religion instrumentally. And on the other hand, you're evoking Benjamin's messianic time. So how do you reconcile these two vectors and further historicize the time and I would say that uh, like it is not just about uh, the usage of religion in a very instrumentalist sense, 
but it is also about uh, it's a very cultural sense like uh, how you like as i was showing the image of you know like these two like cpi uh, members and uh, uh, you know like sitting in the party office to you know working on the periodic production process so and having been also like visited several like houses of uh, you know like comrades like uh, i mean it is the sikh tradition and religion comes much more sometimes it's a overlap sometimes it comes from the it becomes cultural it like becomes like cultural artifact but sometimes it also becomes a strategy but sometimes it is also like there is no this and that sort of thing it's like uh, you know it's holding all these contradictions together so like that and uh, uh, about the i believe that every region has its own story of naxalite movement to tell and that is something which depends upon the like the very regional factors in terms of religion in terms of all kinds of uh, uh, in terms of language in terms of uh, mm. yeah so uh, i think there is no one monolithic sort of narrative that uh, uh, yeah like one could present like that i'm more for the relative <coughs> understanding of this moment yeah. okay yeah um we have another question from the audience Sorry, we have quite a lot of questions, so I'm just going at them. Um, do you think the images are exclusive to the Sufi imagination that's there throughout in the process of decolonization, um, instead of having a common Punjabi line of solidarity? So, do you think there are any sort of other threads other than sort of the um, that you may be able to see these these images? i have not thought of the sufi line um i think i would take it more as a <laughs> point to explore it further uh yeah uh, but uh, probably yeah uh, i mean uh, sikhism does like has a overlap with bhakti and uh, of course it's a product of uh, like that you know that engages with the dialogue with sufi and bhakti movement so maybe there is like uh yeah yeah so uh yeah yeah uh, then we have another question can i ask or i mean can yeah, i repeat yeah, it yeah. yeah okay yeah we have a question from uh jasdeep singh who's saying great presentation kunal have you compared imagery in these magazines to visual representations in khalistani magazines for example how different or same were visuals of the paigam group in the 80s um mm -hmm. also um what have you noticed in visuals of present day naxalite publications like surkhrekha surkhli uh, inkilabi sadara etc so and um for example uh, he writes so the latest cover of um, Surkhrekha has Siddhu Moswala on the cover, claiming him to be Shaheed of the agrarian movement. So, okay. Uh, again, a very fascinating question. Uh, so, uh, since it was more of like uh, archival work that was very much focused to a particular time period, I when I was doing the uh, like archiving, of course, I saw at the library like. Uh, Surkhrekha, like raising uh, all kinds of issues that time. It was about like uh, the activists in prison for uh, Bhima Koregaon. But I have not looked at the Sidhu Mosewala uh, cover, and uh, also have not like uh, kept track of the very latest publications. So uh, yeah, and. Uh, uh, there was also something yeah about. have you compared imagery in these two, yeah those are the yeah. Khalistani magazines the Pagam group yeah so the of course it's like uh the various um, the main contrast comes is like our shaheed and their shaheed 
so it is like the ashahis are like basically the you know uh, like uh, the uh, jamal singh padda then you know like uh, uh, like pash and they have how they are being represented in the covers where the studio portrait of like your know, jamal singh padda like comes again and again in like so many uh, uh, like covers of hira haraval dasta and uh, some of the uh, and when you see the pagam periodicals the uh, you the gunmen who assassinated indra gandhi so they become the main heroes who are like whose portraits have like been uh, you know like represented on the uh, 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 cover but another thing is about the sikh history painting like uh, so here the sikh history painting uh in uh, is being used um, especially in terms of uh like coming from uh, showing that you know they are the true martyrs like the naxalite or you know the true representatives of sikh legacy but if you see the in the pagam there is this one cover where guru gobind singh is basically asking his you know sahib zadas the children to go and you know fight in the battle field so allegorically it almost becomes like you know guru gobind singh himself directing the you know like the sikh youths like basically you know to go and uh, uh, you know fight for the uh, like yeah, desired land so the meaning making changes and of course the heroes who yeah like uh, you know represented in the covers are changed drastically Okay. Okay. Um, okay. We have a we have another one. Um, do you think the the Congressy mode of nationalism had its own impact that restricted these periodicals to have a greater relationship that should have been built across the borders of Punjab between two post-colonial Punjabs? So the Congress is sort of yeah. That's, that's the question. Mm. Uh, do you think the Congress is mode of nationalism? Uh, I mean, this leads to some kind of uh, so-called the Punjabi sort of uh, identity-like question. Um, i i it may have restricted it but then uh, i mean i i mean the solidarity the kind of conversation between the two punjabs and their left has been there it's not mm -hmm. like faz ahmed says is uh, not been you know written about or uh, talked about in the periodicals and uh, yeah so i i'm not sure i got this question right the only thing that i feel that the very debate on the secularism and like firqa against the firqa parasti as uh, you know in the 80s as you know like naxalites like they are talking fighting becomes a representative fighting for secularism or religious tolerance like that is very different from the kind of secular discourse that we generally talk about like which is more like you know if you see any sahmat like thing which you know invoke more like gandhi kabir and uh, like that sort of edge prop politics around secularism <clears throat> here the secularism uh, like the you know like the naxalites who say that we are fighting for the secularism and uh, uh, for the uh, are basically you know like also the gorilla warrior who is like yeah so and uh, there are like such images where you know people are given training to use the gun to counter the khalistanis so here i feel that it becomes a very different kind of a debate of secularism yeah 
which is not like a very yeah gandhian or yeah so called kabir like yeah um i think maybe the same uh, person who sent that question has perhaps continued with another comment to say that i mean the left line um has always preached for a kind of internationalism but the visual mm. elements are seen missing and that could show a more intersectional left resistance i mean the internationalism here is more about it depends like of course it's a this presentation did not entail all kinds of periodicals but many of these periodicals like lucky lucky has a very like fair connection with uh, you know it has two editors one in you know like punjab and the other in south hall and has a very like active connection with indian workers association so uh, and like yeah so uh, so yeah it is probably this kind of impression you got with the kind of material i have presented but i think there is a fair amount of dialogue that is uh, being taken place from the at least with the diaspora with the punjabi sikh or punjabi diaspora in general so okay i'm wondering sanjukta i mean would you have any further sort of comments anything to add uh, if there are no other questions i yeah, can yeah yeah so far no um, no this is one point i had and i have i myself i'm interested in looking at this imagery uh you know you're talking about the early 1970s in the periodicals and i would really ask you to probe a bit more in the 1970s kind of material and um a predominantly <clears throat> dalit composition of viewership readership and so on um uh, is it possible and within the scope of vernacular communism or vernacular activism whatever we call it is there dialogue between um have you been able to trace a broader indian scale even of dalit iconography and, and people are doing this research right uh, of ar around dalit panthers and so on yeah. which is so so underworked and um and that's downright the question of a kind of internationalism that has nothing to do with the nation state right so maybe that could be an interesting uh, line you could draw um Uh, and maybe if there are no direct connections with the dalit panthers in maharashtra maybe other kind of questions then need to be asked to develop yeah. relationality yeah. otherwise these will remain you know there's nothing wrong with locational vernacular material i'm all for it but then it doesn't get activated in historiography then dalit panthers yeah. become something limited to maharashtra as if it had no resonance which is not true yeah um you know yeah. it somehow does no, not enter is, theory yeah so this is something that i was thinking because uh, of course like uh that is the really perplexing thing because uh, dalit panthers is also like inspired from black panthers who were inspired from the maoism and uh, hmm. so it's not like the you know influence of maoism is not there but what kind of conversation is being uh, taking place and or what this gap you know itself leads to you know in not like that it needs to be filled but what kinds of questions yeah. it invokes uh, in terms of like no mb uh, you know mention of ambedkar or engagement with constitution or like those kind of things like uh, even i was a bit surprised to see that they have used like one of the periodical talks about that attack on harijan colony so the mm. <laughs> usage of word harijan was itself uh like uh, that it uh, you know yeah and uh, of course i'm reading the interviews of like someone like gursharan singh and yeah. uh, like uh so he talks about like you know how he be basically like how his conscious raising movement happened when one of his classmate who basically comes from like scavenging valmiki background and uh, who couldn't had to discontinue from going to school and but the thing is he like completely gloss it over with the you know class framework so this okay. caste blindness becomes very important question that yeah. how you know like uh, this 
thing is playing caste blindness is playing out among the communists uh, uh, among this uh, activists in this particular time and not like you know like someone like lal singh dil who has a, like a fascinating story and uh, like any other you know like as a dalit he of course also tortured in jail but tortured more because of his caste then mm-hmm. immigrated like as a migrant you know went to uttar pradesh and then lived among muslims and like you know he said that he felt more equal when he was living with among muslims and then converted to islam so mm-hmm. this is like this fascinating story with uh, like uh, ajay bharadwaj's documentary kithe milve mahi also traces with the very like mm-hmm. post colonial presence of you know popular religion the popular islam and uh, the question of caste with it so mm-hmm. yeah so this uh, and recently i was like, also reading this interview of uh, dalit shukra uh, uh, the interview in jammur who is basically one of the uh, activists of indian workers association and again mm-hmm. like you know bringing the same uh, question uh, like aspect of caste blindness among mm-hmm. the like the activists coming from mostly jet sick loca- caste location but completely like caste blind and whenever the caste was invoked so they will you know like wave communist manifesto like saying mm-hmm. that where it is written where it is you know there so yeah so these autobiographies interviews bring in some really like uh, perplexing disturbing <laughs> aspect that they are how like but that is the source that is the source yeah, that is the yeah. Source. yeah. yeah yeah that is the source um yeah the caste question is of course very resonant with the absence of the race question in um yeah. transnational left and i think contemporary scholarship on uh, dalit aesthetics are making that connection but it might be useful to have that question in mind when you look at the 70s and 80s you might not find answers but you could at least think of if the if there if there are dalit activists who are and they did mm-hmm. make the connection right so um mm. so maybe yeah. some kind of dialogue around freedom and i find there are multiple entry points into a thematic of freedom that can be brought up what you talk mm-hmm. about in the paper is one entry point and then there is a larger um dalit imaginary which need not mm. just be about caste atrocity it can be about a critical discourse mm. on freedom yeah um yeah. and uh um, yeah yeah and decoloniality which is a word we use today a lot but we don't feel like looking at the 60s and 70s for that vocabulary but it was there yeah might be ni- so, also uh, yeah mm-hmm. yeah 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 no because you you, you read the you read the language that's why i feel a lot of there is a lot of material in the vernacular archive for and for around these that if you don't read the languages we don't get to see mm. them um, yeah 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 so that's all i had to say actually yeah yeah uh, so one thing is that yeah um, yeah caste and race question is uh, very in- interesting because uh, that's why i also felt like how angela davis like being basically the kind of solidarity was shown with yeah angela davis but yeah. <laughs> not war with any other so called yeah the dalit figure or anything but uh, um yeah um that is uh, something that and though i was yeah the point I, that i wanted to say was though there is no it doesn't mean that there is no connecting thread because mm. the uh, you know founder of adhadhar movement manguram was mm. also part of the gadar movement so yeah. and uh, i do uh, so like there are those you know like intertwined uh, entwined histories that yeah uh, yeah yeah are uh, yeah are, are there you know uh, uh flashes as benjamin would call it right <laughs> great thank you so much kunal i i have no more questions but thank you for the conversation Um, Kunal, we have uh, another question here from Sir Jadeep Sumal, who says, "Did you find anything about Guru Ravi Das in these magazines or archives? And it might be a way to trace caste." Um, yeah. Uh, so far, whatever I have read, uh, um, like 
Bhai Lalo has come up like one of the uh, like yeah uh, main figures, and I was also listening to one of the performances uh, like Kavishri, where basically it also talks about Bhai Lalo. So yeah, like of course, like this is something uh, which I'm still uh, trying to find out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I. I have a quick uh, sort of question for you, Kunal, which is that, yeah. you know, you had done this initial research, looking at these periodicals, documenting them, like in 2006, around, you said, no, six, seven, as part mm -hmm. of the MA, MA mm -hmm. dissertation work. And then you sort of returned to it, you know, uh, a full decade later. So can you maybe just say a bit about what shifted in that time for you, whether in terms of you know, reaccessing the same materials, the, you know, the interlocutors, or in terms of sort of how you, I mean, if there were shifts in terms of how you sort of frame them, perceive them. Mm, definitely, because uh, um, I think I was, when I was doing research at that time, uh, also like <laughs> I just made my, entry to art history from a very like different field of like from fine arts from like commercial art and also so it was more about like yeah and i think the discourse has also changed like in 2006 there was also not enough literature on the art of the left and it is also this very new scholarships like sanjukta's work is one of it and uh, like you know like Ali Raza but also uh, Lotte Hook uh, and uh, Lelio Dean and uh, uh, Kama McLean's work yeah and Chris Mofat yes. and uh, Daniel Elam so there are these like scholars who like it sometimes it feels like everyone was engaging or <laughs> grappling with this problem at the same time you know like having this, yeah, so uh, it gives a, you know, yeah, those conceptual frameworks are now available in, in terms of like, uh, you know, looking at this material from uh, and asking various kinds of questions of like networks or, you know, the traveling of ideas or the, you know, like what kind of yeah, solidarities were built. So, and the very materiality probably of the thing yeah of the periodical mm -hmm. itself so yeah so and embodied engagements yeah so mm -hmm. yeah yeah um we have a question i mean not a question a comment from shukla savan um she says uh, the refiguring of the vera mukhina sculpture as a poster was interesting we have, however, seen in campus posters how easily heroic imagery is transported across political lines. Um, this uh, makes me think of David Craven's essay, uh, Revolving Definitions of the World Revolution, um, where he points to the similarity between Sergei Konenkov's The Golden Man and Joe Schuster's images for the Superman comic strip suggesting that there is something comic about this bipolar similarity. Oh. Uh, I have not read this particular essay, so, but yeah, uh, I hope someone is reading the comments. Uh, so uh, yeah, because uh, no, uh, I will definitely look into it, but uh, I think when I I did wrote a footnote and but yeah, I didn't include it in the paper that I sent it to uh, Sanjukta. I basically like when it was offered to me, I just felt that, that you know, I am contributing something, you know, to a cause. So it's like that sort of goodwill. I just did it. And uh, it's, uh, you know, like, and uh, yeah, but uh, but yeah, but this is the whole like yeah, the recursive archive that you know it's almost like what is the difference between this culture and Ravi Verma's Lakshmi and Saraswati? It's like you know it's 
circulating with you know some minor modifications or changes so yeah yeah but i will take down uh, this suggestion and and look into it yeah Great. Um, okay, I think um, I think if we have, um, I mean, Kunal, any closing sort of remarks, or um, if we have no further questions from the um, from the audience, um, I mean, what what would? Okay, we do have a question. Okay, so um, um, Arindam Sen writes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, to add to a couple of questions already raised and discussed, one thing that could be interesting for historians and archivists in general is to check for visual affinities between these periodicals and other independent leftist periodicals in South India or Bengal, for example. Um, so like a, like a comparative sort of, um, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. So to see if one can arrive at some sort of formal factor which establishes the periodicals themselves as avant-garde beyond their representational content. So, but it's not in disregard of content. Um, and one historic reference point for such periodicals are those from Soviet Russia in the 1920s, though not limited to these. So would, would something yeah. like a, a yeah, comparative yeah. sort of framework, I mean, is that sure. something yeah. which is- Definitely. Is that, yeah. yeah, is that something which is like, you know, part of your 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 plan. I mean, how is this project going to sort of evolve? I mean, how do you see it sort of moving also? Uh, mostly like uh, so called like uh, in terms of affinities with other scholarships. Like uh, uh, yeah, like for instance, like how religion in the context of Arab communism or in the like communism in uh, Bangladesh has been, mm. you know, used uh, in much more like, yeah, yeah. So I guess definitely through scholarships, you eventually, you know, like uh, do draw certain, uh, uh, you know, like uh, connections with the material. Like when I saw, when I read Partisan Aesthetics, at that time I came to know about, oh, this is Mukina's culture actually, like, you know, because as I, yeah, it was made in as one of the case case cultures in one of the CPI uh, like party congress. Conferences. So yeah, yeah, conferences. So that means like you know, it, of course, it's not just happening in one particular location. That means other locations also people have made those kind of yeah uh, improvisations and yeah. So yeah. It would be a great project, though. Asia Art Archive should uh, should uh, collect the material <laughs> and facilitate. No, <laughs> I mean this is something we actually uh, discussed quite a lot during the course of Kunal's sort of grant as well, yeah. with yeah. regard to um, how or whether these materials where they sit. Uh, mm. You yeah. know. Um, because it's also, um, I mean, they've gone through various periods of, uh, you know, precisely sort of the, the theme of Kunal's talk about sort of how they move from at one point being available in circulation to sort of being forced into the underground in a sense. So this was something that came up repeatedly, even when it came to sort of naming interlocutors on those, you know, because it was tricky. On that, exactly. So, it's tricky. so for so so for the archive, I think it it becomes quite challenging, and yeah. perhaps yeah. So that you know, we we did sort of discuss it quite quite a bit um, at that time about that maybe not everything should be put out there. But yeah. So uh, underground but, networks of uh, scholarship. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think I think at this point we can um, uh, bring um, the, the session to a close and um, thank you so much, uh, Kunal and Sanjukta. I'd like to invite uh, um, I'd like to invite Gayatri Upal, uh, Associate Director, Grants at SSAF, to to conclude the session. Thanks, Neha. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Gayatri Upal. Director at the Shergill, uh, Associate Director at the Shergill Sundaram Arts Foundation. 
On behalf of SSAF, I would like to thank Kunal Dukkar, grantee of the first SSAF AAA research grant for this enlightening presentation titled A Movement of Images in the Political Underground, a study of communist periodicals from 1960 to 1990s Punjab. I would also like to thank Sanjukta Sundaresan for agreeing to be a discussant with Kunal this evening and for an engaging conversation. Thanks, thanks a lot, both of you. I thank the audience for joining us from different parts of the world and time zones and for their attention. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our colleagues at the Asia Art Archive in India and at the Shergil Sundaram Arts Foundation for their contribution to this event. At Asia Art Archive, I'm thankful to Sneha Raghavan, Senior Researcher and Projects Lead, Nupur Desai, Researcher, Samira Bose, Programs Coordinator, and Pallavi Arora, Collections Assistant. At SSAF, I would like to thank Latika Gupta, Director of Projects, Saurav Sil, in charge of Visual Design, Media and Archives, Malavika Matkulkar, Assistant Editor, Publications and Communications, and Santosh Sani, our Accounts Executive. I'm also happy to announce the 2022 grantees of the SSAF AAA Research Grant. See Yamini Krishna for her project titled Sabras, A Glimpse into the Deccani Renaissance, and Hanina PA, PA and Jazila Bashir for their project titled Adhunika Vanita, Revisiting the Mapila Women's Magazines from the Early 20th Century yes. Kerala. You can read more about their projects on both SSAF and AAA's websites, ssaf.in and aaa.org.hk. Uh, Thank you all again for joining us today. Thank you.